The conception of peace on this side of the marginal line is at once realistic and idealistic. We shall forestall the reappearance in Europe of extortion and aggression. And that done, we shall build an inhabitable dwelling place for all men of good faith. It was about dawn this morning that the first reports came in saying that German troops were crossing the frontier into Denmark. At the same time, attacks were being delivered from the sea on a number of Norway's biggest ports. The Oslo radio is still working and has announced that German troops have disembarked at Egersund on the south coast of Norway and that Christian Sand has been attacked and also bombed. The supreme command of the German defense forces announces the operations to occupy Denmark and the Norwegian coast have proceeded according to plan today. On marching into and landing on Danish territory, no incidents occurred anywhere. No significant resistance was offered along the coast of Norway except near Oslo. Resistance there was broken during the afternoon and Oslo itself was occupied. The German minister to Norway, Dr. Breyer, received representatives of the Norwegian press today and informed them of a new appeal which he has addressed to the Norwegian government. It runs as follows. In recalling this morning's appeal, I wish once more to draw the attention of the Norwegian government to the fact that any resistance to Germany's action would be completely senseless and would only lead to an aggravation of Norway's position. I repeat that by her measures, Germany does not intend to infringe the territorial integrity or political independence of the Kingdom of Norway either now or in the future. This morning, strong German forces have entered or have been landed in these two countries. To cover these military operations, extensive mine barrages have been laid. While British and French military experts are still writing articles, wondering why Germany has not yet started a blitzkrieg on the Western Front, lightning-like actions of the German defense forces have informed Mr. Churchill and Monsieur Paul Reynaud that Germany is not prepared to allow Great Britain and France to infest the North Sea, the Arctic Sea, and Northern Europe with further strategic positions like Gibraltar, Malta, and Corsica. New Germany is determined to deal any power a decisive blow if that power stretches out its hands with the intention of throttling the German people. Germany has no quarrels with Denmark and Norway but Germany has carefully studied the maritime history of Great Britain. She remembers Copenhagen in 1807. She remembers the seizing of Malta and Gibraltar. She remembers the bombardment of Alexandria in 1882, and she has not forgotten that England and France were making preparations to occupy the Balearic Islands during the Spanish Civil War. That attempt was frustrated by Italian watchfulness. Germany has for months been just as observant and alive to the danger which threatens all strategical points in Northern Europe that might serve as naval or air force bases for Great Britain and France in their war of destruction against Germany. Mr. Winston Churchill knows today that he has no longer any chance of repeating his exploits of Sydney Street in Antwerp, Gallipoli and Murmansk. That versatile and agile amateur strategist is at last up against a leadership and a defense force of a people keyed up to a maximum of activity and having achieved the acme of technical perfection. They do not have to discuss the Blitzkrieg as a theoretical problem because they are the human embodiment of that cleansing atmospheric phenomenon, the thunderstorm which dispels the sultry atmosphere of intrigues and conspiracies, of political crime and of indifference to human suffering. German motorized troops and tanks, which crossed the German-Danish frontier near Flensburg and Tondern, 
at 5.15 a.m. this morning are now on their way north via Apenrada and Esbjerg. Today at dawn, German troops landed near Middelfart on the Little Belt and occupied the bridge over the Little Belt. German naval forces have entered the Great Belt and landed troops at Corsair and Newbork. German troops and a German armoured train have crossed the Baltic by ferry from Warnemünde to Gensa, whence they are advancing northwards. The Fordingborg Bridge, connecting the islands of Zeeland and Falster, was occupied at the same time. At dawn, German troops landed in Copenhagen. The citadel and the wireless station were occupied. Since 8 a.m., the whole town has been in German hands. The Supreme Command and the German Defence Forces further announces. The advance of the German troops northwards in Jutland and on the Danish islands is making rapid progress. The Danish government has instructed the Danish troops to offer no resistance. The German and Danish military commanders establish contact during the morning. The occupation of the most important strategic points in the whole of Norway by German troops is progressing quickly. Units of all three branches of the German Defence Forces are successfully cooperating. At most points, the slight local resistance of Norwegian troops has ceased. On the air bases in Jutland and southern Norway, German Air Force units have landed. The Supreme Command of the German Defence Forces further announces. During the evening of April the 8th, German Heinkel bombers again attacked British naval forces lying at anchor in Scarpa Flow with considerable success. Two capital ships, amongst them a battleship, were severely damaged by bombs. Three further heavy units were considerably damaged by explosions which occurred in the immediate vicinity of these ships. During April the 8th, extensive reconnaissance flights over the North Sea as far as the 65th degree north and over north and eastern France were carried out by the German Air Force. Two British warplanes, a fighter and a Sunderland seaplane, were shot down. Two German planes are missing. This morning, the German minister in Copenhagen handed to the Danish government a German note explaining the attitude of the German government in regard to the plans of the Allies to extend the war to Scandinavia and informing it that Germany will ensure the protection of Danish neutrality and of the security of Denmark. As a result of conversations between the German minister and the Danish prime minister and cabinet, the Danish government decided, in consideration of the circumstances, to accept German protection with a diplomatic proviso and to agree to the conditions outlined in the German note. It is reported from Copenhagen that the whole city is perfectly quiet. The Danish authorities have promised their most loyal cooperation. The Danish radio is broadcasting its scheduled program, and the Copenhagen newspapers are being published as usual. No incidents have occurred in Copenhagen or during the occupation of Jutland. Swedish press features the events in Denmark and Norway. The wise attitude of the Danish government has made a deep impression on the Swedish population. Swedish public opinion is convinced that the events in Norway will not lead to a more extensive conflict. In well-informed political circles in Sweden, the opinion prevails that Swedish neutrality is not menaced by Germany, so long as England does not attempt to violate it. There are the Reich Center Hamburg, Station Bremen 1, Station Bremen 2, and Station DJB. This is the end of our news in English. Our next transmission of news in English will take place at 7.15 p.m. British Summer Time and will be broadcast from Hamburg, Bremen, and DJA on the 31 meter band. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Germany calling, Germany calling, Germany calling.
I want to discuss with you some topics of current interest. Four days ago, under the orders of their supreme commander, the German forces established one of the greatest feats and triumphs in the annals of military history. In relation to the magnitude of its achievement, the campaign was the shortest of which any record is available. Three weeks ago, Mr. Chamberlain predicted the possibility of warfare in Scandinavia. Nobody in Britain paid any great attention to his prophecy, as it lacked the note of novelty. For months, Mr. Winston Churchill had been lecturing the neutrals on their duties and using veiled threats to coerce them into hostilities on Britain's side. Mr. Horribleisher, a man well qualified to voice the sentiment of international finance, had openly demanded that the Allies should intervene by force of arms in the Russo-Finnish war, regardless of the violation of Scandinavian neutrality which such intervention must imply. On the day when Finland suddenly saw wisdom and made peace, the British Prime Minister, knowing that the Russo-Finnish war was over, offered to fight side by side with the Finns to the bitter end. And Monsieur Galadier revealed the fact that 50,000 troops had been standing by for a fortnight, ready to invade Scandinavia. As Milton says, they also serve who only stand and wait. However, the depression which settled over London when the Russians and the Finns came to terms began to lift gradually but surely. There emerged a feeling that if only Mr. Churchill were given full power to do as he pleased, some brilliant result could be achieved somewhere. Accordingly, he was promoted to what in effect is the supreme command of the British forces. Although he clung to nations to the Admiralty, where he had taken the trouble to install his 25-year-old furniture, a pair of carpet slippers, and three telephones, black, red, and green, for ordinary, extraordinary, and secret purposes, respectively. Thus fortified, the aged warlord of far-famed Gallipoli renown was set up by Neville Chamberlain as the man who was a match for Hitler. Lord Crewe paved the way for the climax by stating on behalf of the British government that Britain did not propose to be bound by technical considerations of international law. The violation of Norwegian territorial waters by the brutal and murderous attack on the Altmark was the only victim that Britain had so far won. But it was encouraging. It had been possible to shoot unarmed seamen on the ice in neutral territory without incurring any terrible vengeance. And it seems that the more British strategists pondered upon the success of this glorious operation, the more certainly they began to feel that a warfare conducted upon these lines was bound to succeed. The next stage was marked by a loud trumpeting and braying from the British Prime Minister as his chief of staff, General Ironside. They trembled to think of what might have happened had Germany launched an armed offensive last September. But all was well now. Hitler, poor fellow, had missed the bus. The corner had been turned. Mr. Churchill's forces were prepared for all eventualities. And Mr. Chamberlain felt ten times as confident as he had felt seven months previously. This barrage of joyous optimism having been thrown up, the British government announced its intention of converting Norway's territorial waters into a naval zone by laying mines within them. Norway protested, and her protest was rejected. When she had protested against the outmark outrage, she was met with a counter protest. This time she was met with the advance of the British Navy and Air Force against her. Whilst, however, this advance was beginning, something dramatic happened. The man who had missed the bus acted like lightning. This Mercedes Benz proved rather better than the trundling rolling stock of the London General Omnibus Company. 
The Supreme Warlord of Whitehall discovered on Tuesday morning, doubtless with the help of his colored telephone, that Denmark and Norway had been occupied by German forces. Their economic resources had fallen into German hands. England had lost not only the most valuable sources of bacon, butter, timber, nickel, and iron. She had lost all hope of making Scandinavia a strategic base of operations against Germany and the men who missed the bus. She had lost the military game. She had lost the diplomatic game. She had, in fact, most thoroughly lost faith. Did the illustrious descendant of Barbara, and that's the thing with gallop down to the nearest naval base on his foaming charger and offer to lead his men to death or glory? Far from it. He had a more important task to accomplish. He had to set to work without further ado to devise some kind of plausible explanation for the millions of his Britannic Majesty's subjects who were hanging on his words. After more than 48 hours of reflection and excogitation, he produced quite the most miserable effort of his rhetorical career. This remarkable performance, which might well have been billed as positively my last appearance, was staged before the British House of Commons yesterday. For platitude, inanity, shuffling evasions, and verbosity without content, it stands alone in the history of the old mother of Parliament. The fire-eating, choleric, bragging, Mines Gloriosa suddenly became the nervous advocate with an illegible brief. Those who had expected the thunder of Britain's might to roll forth, those who had waited to see the blue lightning flashing through the oratorical museum of Westminster must have been sorely disappointed. Let us examine one or two of his fundamental statements. First of all, first of all, his most learned strategic advisor, said he, told him that Hitler had made a great mistake. Yes, veritably Germany had committed a blunder which would greatly weaken her position. In fact, one must infer from his words that we have really played into his hands. He did not go quite so far as to say that the British laying of mines in Norwegian waters had merely been intended to tempt Germany to occupy Scandinavia. He left that to be inferred by his more credulous admirers. But his clear and distorted little mind had worked out a plea designed to convince the British people that what Hitler had done was, after all, a good thing. Reasoning along the same lines, he expressed the conviction, the earnest assurance, that in the new circumstances, it would be much easier for Britain to blockade Germany effectively. If you do not believe me, Read his speech for yourself. Yes, Britain now commanded the pharaohs, and another loophole in the blockade of the Reich was closed. So at one fell swoop, Hitler, by acquiring the coastline of the North Sea and establishing German air bases upon it, had made Mr. Churchill's task much easier. And by confiscating the Norwegian and Danish merchant fleets, he had assisted Britain's carrying trade. And by acquiring access to the agricultural wealth of Denmark, Germany had made her starvation more certain. By seizing the iron and timber of Norway, Germany had dealt a fatal blow at her own armament. Yes, as the poet wrote about one of Marlborough's battles, it was a famous victory. So much for Mr. Churchill in the higher style. Let us now descend, if you can bear it, to examine his lower reaches of mental activity. Norway, he said, was a wild, mountainous, unfriendly land where free men could find shelter easily and fight. A great consolation for the Norwegians. Naval warfare, he explained, was less predictable than warfare on land. More distances, storms, mists, and even the darkness of night all played their part. He seems to have been thinking of what British insurance brokers call acts of God. Then said he, you may wonder why I have held all this back until Thursday afternoon. But there was an explanation of the most ingenious order 
The British naval personnel, he actually said, were so interested in their work that they often had no time to report what was happening. This is a feature of communication of which any first lord must surely be proud. And in the army, we suppose, the colonel gets a telephone call from his brigadier to ask how things are going, and he curtly says, Look here, old chap, do ring off. I'm so busy. Certainly warfare is changing. Then, said the first lord, German ships will be sunk in the Skagerrak and the Katagan. Whenever the opportunity occurred. This was a brilliant generalization, if not a very blood channeling threat. Hitler, of course, is to be deposed when the opportunity occurs. There could, however, he went on, be nothing more stupid than to expect that British forces should constantly patrol the coastal waters of Norway and Denmark, thus constituting targets for Hitler's humor. These were Mr. Churchill's wisest words. The best method of protecting Britain's invaluable forces is to keep them out of Germany's way. Thus, the German occupation of Scandinavia has been accepted as a matter of fact. But, of course, a number of demonstrations must be arranged to convince the British public that Mr. Churchill is still earning his salary. He might have been wiser if he had frankly told the House of Commons that this occupation was so firmly established that practical measures to end it were outside the limits of possibility. Perhaps the most humorous and yet the most pathetic observation which Mr. Churchill made, was that in the international lottery, Norway and Denmark had drawn the unlucky numbers. But still, he assured them of British sympathy, and they probably thought of the sympathy which had been poured out so lavishly to Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Finland. The old story has been repeated once again. The cat's paw is used and then discarded. The British government deliberately placed Norway in a compromising position. It was well known to the King's minister that Germany would not tolerate the occupation of Norwegian waters by British forces. The Norwegian protest was contemptuously rejected, and when Norway had to accept the consequences of British policy, the British Broadcasting Corporation played some Norwegian military marches and Mr. Churchill expressed his deep sympathy and condolence, at the same time pointing out that Norwegian land was well suited to guerrilla tactics. And yet, some people wonder what is meant. One of the German long distance reconnaissance planes of the DO 18 type is overdue from a flight over the North Sea. German troops have now occupied the fortresses of Oskarsborg and Drobach in the Oslo Fjords and have considerably strengthened the fortifications there. The fortification work at these two points was completed today and at 10 a.m. practice shooting began after the population of Oslo had been informed that it was to take place. The dismissal of all troops decided upon by the Danish War Minister and Admiralty has been practically completed by today, and no new recruits will be called up for the time being. The vessels of the Danish coastal defences are on their way home, and on arrival their crews will also be dismissed. Only a small Danish detachment will remain under arms for the purpose of keeping order. The official Swedish news agency has published a statement denying the allegations made by foreign broadcasting stations to the effect that arms and ammunition had been found on board German ships arriving at Swedish ports. It is officially stated in Stockholm that these assertions are utterly unfounded. The Swedish newspaper, Volker Stadler, points out that the nature of Britain's action in Norway was clearly revealed by the landing of British troops in the northern part of Norway. This is no support for the fighting Norwegian troops, writes the paper, and goes on to say that obviously Britain's only intention was to gain control over the port of Narvik and the north of the country. After referring to the importance attached by Britain to the Swedish iron ore exports to Germany, the Swedish paper states that if British troops succeeded in firmly digging themselves in at Narvik, it was very likely that they would attempt to gain control over the Swedish iron ore district. 
such an attempt by Britain would lead to an open conflict with Sweden, concludes Falkert Starglass, and will at the same time be a direct threat against Russia. Germany calling. This is the end of our news. You are now about to hear a dialogue. their acquaintance in a Swiss hotel and formed the habit of discussing current topics. Smith, in a mood of some excitement, calls for refreshment and begins his verbal attack on Schmidt. I say, old man, I didn't think I should be talking you to you today, or eh? Oh, why not? Well, damn it all, the real world's begun. And if so, did you expect to be called up? Damn it all, man. Don't be so confounded to think that it's so, uh, so, uh, callous. Why, then, I guess it's just calm and collected. Calm and collected? You seem to have collected Denmark and Norway, all right. Capacity. Three. File status with international law. Foul infection of mutual rights. Another German crime. Dear me. You are such another bunch of papers in phone. Yes. Oh, man. How did you know? Oh, well, I seem to recognize the family language. Wait, I'll tell you what comes next. The tide turns. Strong British measure. Glorious naval victory. Bloody expedition is oh. rapidly advancing. German Navy wiped out. Hitler in terror. Church in Sweden sent major. I say, oh boy, you know, these are the very lines on which I was thinking. Very odd, I don't think. Oh, well, I've seen a few of them, you know. I, I saw the heavy headlines in the Daily Herald announcing as a fact the British capture of Bergen and Then, in a subsequent issue, I saw an angry editorial cursing the government up hill and down there, laughing to knife at the issue of such blatant false information. I saw... I say, old boy, it is quite fair to bring up such things against us. You know, the bad faces might have been captured. Then we'd have been the first of the hill, what? Oh, well, if that is the standard of reporting, uh, which you set yourself, I begin to understand some of the reports in the BBC, to which I've been listening during the last few days. But you know, the Daily Herald went on to say that this method of handling the news has made England look so ridiculous in the eyes of the whole world. Ah, socialist rags, damn socialist rags. What they want is a little racism rammed down our throats. Yes, sir. A little of patriotism from the Churchill branch, right? They may not want it at all. But you tell me what you think of Churchill's remarkable statement that Hitler has made a strategic error in occupying Scandinavian territory. What? Oh, oh, yes, by chance, Marvelous political and military insight. Shows the freak of genius, what? I mean, old fellow, a less gifted man would never have seen it. What? That is a matter of opinion. Uh, but would you mind telling me why you think this statement so marvelous? In Germany, you see, people think it's simply idiotic. Ah, yes, that's because you Huns have no brain. Not a damned idea about strategy at all. Now, just look at what we have gained. That's what I'm waiting most curiously to hear. Well, my dear chap, you can study old Winston's speech of Mark Gaffley. You see, they've got the pharaohs. And Winston will see to it that not one of your troops shall set foot in Iceland. Then, the Dr. Murgatroyd of the Foreign Office told me this morning that Greenland was the safest at Bank of England. He also mentioned some other places with uh, outlandish names, but Pittsburgh I think, just France, just the land, maybe, uh, I'm not quite sure. But anyhow, you needn't expect to lay hands on them. I do not think that any such expectation was ever entertained by our high command. Neither has he any intention of annexing the North Pole. Oh, haven't you? Oh. I read a well-informed article in the Sunday Creeper the other day, according to which you Nazis were most anxious for reasons of prestige and all that to get the Barrio North Pole. Not prestige, surely. What the writer really meant was that he wanted to get control of terrestrial magnetism and hinder your shipping by putting all your nautical compasses out of action. Well, I'm not a scientist, but uh, even if you want to say you can that time, how is the man to stop me? Got to go, old man. I see you are pulling my leg. Well, I'll do that. 
But I was just observing with interest the readiness uh, with which you have checked any cock and bull story that is even said to have been published in your press. But do let us come down to something real and tangible. Do you mean to say that you are satisfied with all this talk about Iceland and the Ferrier and other places equally insignificant to us from the strategical point of view? Well, old man, between ourselves, I'm frightfully interested in the Gallic Sea. And our exposition will fall from the north of Norway. Round about now, if you know. What? Good lad. Uh, uh. Can you mention any of these guarantees? Well, uh, not yet, but do wait until the next batch of papers come. Then I'll have something to tell you, all right. Anyhow, old boy, I'll bet you anything you like. You know it. Well, we seem to be some time in using it. But why do you think that we cannot hold it? Well, damn it, all of the chap are calling for the staff, but the railway's been blown up. There are no real roads to the south, so you can't maintain your barrier communications. The dear old town might just as well be in another country, what? Very interesting. I'm not going to indulge in their predictions, because unlike yourself, I do not prefer to have fresh and authentic information from Nazi every hour. But if, as you say, there are no railway or good communications between Nazi and the main part of Norway, if to use our own expression, the uh, dear old town might just as well be in another country, then I utterly fail to see what strategically important it could have for you. What? What? Damn it, sir. All this is getting very tangled. Uh, say it again. Well, to put the idea more simply, you are relying on taking Narvik because it is too remote from the main part of Norway to descend effectively. If that is true, I do not see, if it is untrue, what advantage you can secure by occupying it. My dear chap, don't be silly. Have you forgotten dear old England's prestige? What? Damn it all. Think of how it would cheer up the old folks at home. If they could read that this great northern city had been captured, what? Like most of the city, isn't it? No, not at all. It is a town with the distant wires is not strategically important to us. We can get our arm out to the Baltic. And it will take you a very long time to build a railway under the supervision of the German Air Force. Oh, oh that's a nice way of putting it. I must tell that to the doctor. But if Narvik is so bloody useless as you make out, why hang on to it? Well, it is no part of our plan to facilitate your operation for the point that they may be. If you want to achieve a little prestige in order to keep the home front quiet, you must stay for it and stay very at that. What am I talking about? You don't have to talk to them, I say, ugly. My dear chap, I asked the doctor for the very same question this morning. And he said, well, of course, you see, the napkins are solidly in print for us. And the time is not yet right for another Gallipoli. Of course, if the public wants the Scandinavian Gallipoli, it can have one. But I think, my dear chap, that there's so much trouble brewing in the Balkans. And we don't need to look for our Gallipolis in the frozen north. That's what he said to me, old son. Word for word. I'm not quite sure that I know what to make of it. But it's straight from the heart of mouth for what it's worth. That's right. It comes down to this. Yes. Your government is just taking a rather futile operation in Scandinavia in order to manufacture propaganda for home consumption. Bluff, in fact. Oh, my dear old Smith. When will you learn to say things? Thing about politics. 
the Jaden. Now, they're just cats, too. Tom say the case. Sit the Well, then, uh, might as well have lunch for something more weak in the world. And how is that, eh? What's the use of trying to save and civilize people if they don't want it? Dismal. They have been, so how you say, fallen and thinner. I say, old boy, must you bring that up again? I mean, they still have our goodwill. And if we didn't want to save them, well, we told Johnny and Roger exactly what we thought about them. Is that all? Well, uh, my dear old fellow, until they are coming to school, on our model, all over Europe. Ah, what did we think? Well, I must have a word for the doctor. He looks pretty gloomy. Go on. Kill him now, Sir Fletcher. Poor old Smith. And he's not so poor. He is in fact him. Get out of the right center, huh, boy? Station Brayman 1, Brayman 2, and Dwarf Street. This is the end. On the 3rd September haben die Machthaber in England und Frankreich dem Deutschen Reich den Krieg erklärt. On September 3rd, England and France declared war against Germany. Without any reasonable arguments. Haben seit dem Januar 1933 ständig ihren Willen bekundet mit dem englischen und dem französischen Volk. In Frieden, Ever since January 1933, Germany has shown its goodwill towards England and France. In Umständen, in heiliger Entschlossenheit, den ihnen angesagten Krieg auf. Der Plan der englisch-französischen Machthaber, das Deutsche Reich aufzulösen, das deutsche Volk politisch zu entrechten, und die Allies plan to destroy Germany, will be fought with all our power. Und deshalb zu Schanden werden. Nachdem nun von vornherein ein direkter Angriff auf den deutschen Westwall als aussichtslos erkannt war und der von den englischen und französischen Machthabern gegen Deutschland vorgetriebene polnische Verbündete versagte, suchte man verzweifelt nach neuen Möglichkeiten, um Deutschland beizukommen. After an attack on the West Wall seemed impossible and after Poland had failed, they tried to find some other means of destroying Germany. England and Frankreich versuchen deshalb seit Beginn des Jahres mit allen Mitteln ein Hereinziehen neutraler Staaten und eine Verlagerung des Kriegsschauplatzes dadurch herbeizuführen. Since the beginning of this year, England and France have tried with all their means to bring about a new scene of war. According to old custom, England is trying to spare its own blood. They have started a systematic campaign against the principle of neutrality. On the 20th of January 1940, Churchill, Deutschland anzuschließen, hierzu den on January 21st, Churchill, which his request to the neutral nations has made the beginning of this campaign.